classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 15, Moron Probe Diffusion. I'm Professor Phillies, and this is Lecture 2 <coughs> of our discussion of probe diffusion, measure experimental studies of polymer solution dynamics based on measuring the diffusion of rigid objects, small or large, through polymer solutions. In our last lecture, we discussed the dynamics of small and large probes, in which we have something that might be a fraction of a nanometer up to hundreds of nanometers across. It diffuses through polymer solutions. As it diffuses, we can measure how rapidly, and we can determine how the diffusion rate depends on the concentration of the matrix polymer, the polymer in the surrounding solution, how it depends on the molecular weight of the matrix polymer, and other features. Today we're going to push on to consider a few other things. The first thing we're going to discuss, which is section 9.5, is reentrance. I'm not quite sure where to put reentrance into the discussion. It could be described as there is this extra phenomenon you see on rare occasions. It's not clear why you're seeing it. It's not clear what it is, but there are not, it's been seen enough times that we can group all of the observations together. Uh, the starting point, we measure diffusion versus concentration. And we are doing this for polystyrene spheres in O, polyethylene oxide water. This is my own work with the almonds. We are in polyethylene oxide water. And the simple behavior, which is what is usually seen for the diffusion coefficient, gives us a curve that looks like this on a log-log plot. That's a stretched exponential. However, and we didn't actually quite discover it in the natural order of things on how we worked things out, if you take particular size of spheres, and particular molecular weights of polyethylene oxide. And since it's not the small ones or the large ones, I think it must be some specific chemical property of the particular polymers. At least that was our best guess. And the right size spheres, what you see is a phenomenon that looks like that. That is, the diffusion coefficient first increases with increasing polymer concentration. <clears throat> and then goes down again and gets back to about where you would have expected D to be at that concentration. And gee, what is this? Well, that's a good question. You can see the same phenomenon or something somewhat similar. There is nice work by Juan et al. And what Juan et al. look at all at was a cross-linked polystyrene sphere and polyvinyl methyl ether toluene. And what they found was something that looked, if you look at their diffusion coefficients, a bit different. Namely, here is the smooth curve you find <coughs> if you fit most of their measurements to a stretched exponential. But in the middle, what you suddenly see is this region where the diffusion coefficient heads off for whatever reason and then comes back again. And we're talking about um, polystyrene spheres that are um, seemingly of a reasonable size. The concentration in what are called natural units, units where the intrinsic viscosity has dimensions 1 over concentration, C eta, gets up to about 36. And there is this narrow regime where, gee, things don't work the way you would have expected. <clears throat> and the question is, what are you looking at? Well, there are other cases 
that look like the first of these two found for polyelectrolytes. I've just shown two examples for neutral polymers. The question is, how are you seeing this? What are you seeing? Um, one general explanation has to do with the question, well, what sort of a diffusion coefficient are you looking at if you are measuring things with quasi-elastic light scattering? And if you simply have a single set of diffusing species, everything is completely uniform, your light scattering spectrum or the dynamic structure factor, that's all discussed in chapter 4, on a semi-log plot is a nice straight line. You can measure its slope anywhere, you get the same answer. Life is very simple. And that would correspond, as a general statement, to Brownian particles in water, some system with no memory. In polymer solutions, though, life becomes more complicated. And if you look at the relaxation spectrum that you get with light scattering, you can get several relaxational modes. What information does light scattering give about those modes? Well, let us redraw this. And I will now redraw the light scattering spectrum on a log-log plot. And if the modes are separated, you get a first relaxation like that. That's sort of what a, um, an exponential looks like on a log-log plot. And then you may get another exponential or stretched exponential or something. And you have different things happening on different time scales. <coughs> The reasonable presumption, which is active, and there's a way to test it we'll get to in a second, is that both of these processes are going on at all times. And therefore, if you measure the initial slope of the relaxation, it's the sum of the rate determined by this faster mode plus the rate determined by this slower mode. And light, if you do what we call cumulant analysis, that is, if you ask, what does the initial slope of this curve look like? And, and it doesn't have to be approximated as a straight line. You could approximate it as something that is fancier than a straight line. What does that initial slope give us? Well, it gives us the average of all of the relaxation rates <coughs> weighted for how much they, amplitude they each have. Yeah. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you sit around to long times, if you look out here and measure the relaxation rate, you only see the slowest mode. The fast mode has relaxed away. Now, that doesn't mean <coughs> that if you wait a bit, <coughs> the particles are no longer moving in the rapid mode. What it means is the particles have moved far enough that the, their positions with respect to the rapid mode are not correlated with their initial positions. And therefore, even though the rapid process is going on, the rapid process quits contributing to the relaxation spectrum because this has gone off to zero. The new process relates to particles starting at positions that are uncorrelated with their initial positions. <clears throat> it is sometimes said, if you see these fast and slow modes, there are people who will look purely at the time dependence of the diffusion process and say, oh, you're seeing caging. And the notion in caging, which is a perfectly legitimate possibility, is that we have a probe particle. It is somehow confined into a region of space where it can move rather rapidly. But it can't get very far. And if it wants to move a large distance, it must, for example, hop to a new region where it's happy to sit. And the hopping process is slow. <coughs> now, if you do have caging, if you have regions that are, in some sense, low potential energy or dynamically restricted but free to move within, then over, sh over short times, you'll see motion within a cage. And at long times, you will see the motion, the slower process in which things hop from cage to cage to cage. 
Now, once the object gets here, it still does have the fast motion within its new cage, but these positions and these positions are uncorrelated, and therefore this motion does not contribute to the spectrum. Having described caging, I would like to emphasize that the time dependence measurement gives you absolutely no evidence as to whether the caging interpretation is correct. Question. What happens to the processes when it's moving from uh, the, the, the confined region and moving slowly, uh, when it's hopping? When it ha what happens between here and there? How does that show up in the time scale, like the, the slower process, how does that show up? In the oh, the slower process when it's doing this is the slow mode. I see. That is, there is a part of the position of the object that stays correlated with its initial position as long as the object is trapped here. And only when the object has done a bunch of hops does the last piece of its initial position get forgotten. Thank you. Okay? So that is the question. Uh, the reason you don't see anything is that light scattering spectroscopy, a single spectrum, only gives you information about motion on one distance scale. Now it's a Fourier scale, not a linear distance scale. So you're looking at the relaxation of a spatial Fourier component of the concentration. That's why you can see both modes in the light scattering spectrum. However, if you just look at a single Q and measure the spectrum as a function of time, which is what, how the experiment is usually done, you are not directly generating any evidence of hopping. Uh, indeed, if you go back a few, ch uh, few chapters, there is this paper by, um, I believe it was Nimoto and collaborators, where they look at light scattering and sedimentation. Yes. Sedimentation is intrinsically a long distance process. Light scattering Wave, light wavelength distance. And what they demonstrate is that the long distance motions are faster than the slow distance motions, which is sort of the negative of caging in some sense. Okay, so we have said at short time you are seeing all of the relaxations put together in a light scattering spectrum. And at long time the light scattering spectrum only shows you the slowest relaxational modes you will sometimes encounter a literature error. And the literature error show, claims that if you look at the light scattering spectrum at short times and measure the initial slope or whatever, you are purely and exclusively seeing the fast modes. That's complete nonsense. It's simply not true. Okay, so if there are several modes, can we just measure them directly? And that is answered in section 9.6. And 9.6 discusses spectra with multiple modes. Now we will come back to discuss multiple mode spectra again when we discuss pro optical probe studies of hydroxypropyl cellulose solutions. However, there are so many studies of HPC solutions that they're grouped all in their own um, subchapter, their own section, and we'll get to those separately. And we start out with studies by um, Bremel. And what was done was to say, well, we will take solutions of sodium polyacrylamide, and it's a polyelectrolyte, and we will put in probes, and the probes that were put in were uh, polystyrene latex or hematite particles, and we look at the spectrum. And what was found was that there were two spectral modes. The two spectral modes um, were both fairly close to exponential. They could be characterized separately in terms of a diffusion coefficient. But what was observed under various conditions is that if you have several modes, life can become much more complicated. And you can have modes whose relaxation rate does this, 
and loads whose rate does that, that starts to look familiar. That's the polyethylene oxide thing. And modes for which you only see this, and well, you could always think it might do that. And so you have two modes visible in the spectrum, and the two behavior of the two modes is different in different cases. <clears throat> now, having said that, there is now a possible explanation or partial explanation for some of the polyethylene oxide data. Namely, if you have a spec system that's giving you two spectral modes, it's possible that under some conditions one mode is dominant, under some conditions the other mode is dominant. With the limited, more limited anyhow, technology that was available in the early 1980s, which is when the polyethylene oxide data was done, well, sometimes you basically see this as the dominant mode in the spectrum, and sometimes you see this. And if you had examined the same system with modern technology, you'd find that two modes were present, and one or the other was more prominent. Okay, let us consider to um, <clears throat> advance to some additional work by Bremel and Dunstan. And we are looking at um, polystyrene sulfonate spheres. What is the point? We say polystyrene, and you will notice there, I say carboxylate modified polystyrene spheres, or this modified, or that modified. And in the case in question, they're in a copolymer. Okay, why do I mention the modification? Well, it's like this. You have a sphere. It's made of polystyrene. Polystyrene is not at all water-soluble. If it were water-soluble, you'd pour coffee into your cup in the morning, and the cup would dissolve. And it would be full of polystyrene, which is not <clears throat> necessarily something you want to drink huge quantities of, not if it's water soluble suddenly. Um, and the answer is, in order to get this stuff into water and persuade it to stay there, what you have to do is to charge up the surface, and the charge up the surface is usually done by chemical surface modification. So for example, you have, there's a carboxylate group, it's an organic acid group, and it's been fully ionized, so you've, you add a little base, or that was done by the manufacturer, really. And now you have these ch little charged spheres, and since the spheres are charged, they're ha they repel each other, and they're happy to stay in water. And it's a real solution. Okay, so what Bremel and Dunstan did was to look, and they see their modes again, and they see things that look like this, except, well, perhaps it doesn't go on quite as far. And then they say something, they do two things. The first thing they do is to say, um, gee, the diffusion coefficient can be used to calculate a micro viscosity. A to micro, this is the Stokes Einstein equation, but it's being written. where the variables I measure are the particle size and the diffusion coefficient, and the quantity I calculate from them in k and t and 6 and pi, the quantity I calculate from them is the microviscosity, the uh, viscosity that would explain the diffusion coefficient. And what was found for these experiments was that the microviscosity for the slow mode appeared to be larger than the, micro, the orthodox viscosity of the solution. And the microviscosity that corresponded to the fast mode was clearly less than the viscosity of the solution. That is, if you have two modes, you have two diffusion coefficients that you can infer from them. And because you have two diffusion coefficients that you can infer from them, um, you can calculate a microviscosity for each one. And since the two curves are not parallel at all, you get two different behaviors for the microviscosity. Um, the next thing that they did was to say, well, 
we will look at several scattering angles. And because we are looking at several scattering angles, the wave vector Q, the scattering vector in the light scattering experiment, changes. Now the reason that's significant is the thing that you're measuring in light scattering, the dynamic structure factor, depends on the scattering vector. What does, that, what does the dynamic structure factor tell you? Well, we wait, a, we wait a while and eventually there is a fluctuation in the concentration, a cosinusoidal fluctuation, that has a wave vector Q. And the wave vector Q corresponds to the scattering vector of the scattered light. Now actually these fluctuations go on all the time. They have, occur simultaneously at all wave vectors, not just one. But if you wait for a moment when the scattered light is really bright, you can correctly infer that the fluctuation of the correct scattering vector to get light out of the laser beam and to your detector, that fluctuation must be fairly large. And now you wait and ask what happens at later times. And on the average, you have to do this many times, that's what the correlation function measures, uh, the size of the fluctuation on the average relaxes back to zero. It doesn't do it all the time relaxing back to zero or it could never get big. It fluctuates, but on the average, if you wait for moments when it's large, the fluctuation relaxes back to zero. And the relaxation is the scattering spectrum. <clears throat> if you change the scattering vector, you're changing the distance scale over which you're watching motions. Now, since you're looking at a concentration fluctuation that looks like this, particle motions over distances that are significantly less than this wavelength contribute to relaxing the fluctuation. And the particles can move various different distances, but if they start at a maximum and head off towards the minimum, they reduce the size of the fluctuation. So you're not looking at exactly at motions on a single distance, but you're, there's a distance scale in there. So what happens? What happened when they did this experiment? There are two modes, a fast mode and a slow mode. And what they found was that the diffusion coefficient of the slow mode is independent of scattering angle. And that is the pro behavior you get if you have a process that is purely diffusive. A single diffusion process will give you a relaxation that goes as e to the minus the diffusion coefficient Q squared T, that's a single exponential relaxation. The relaxation rate goes as Q squared. But if you pull the Q squared out and ask what is the diffusion coefficient, the diffusion coefficient is the same on all distance scales. And so what they said is that their slow mode process goes as Q to the zero and that implies that their slow mode process is in fact diffusive. The fast mode process, however, was quite different. They measured the apparent diffusion coefficient at different scattering vectors. Larger scattering vector, a larger scattering vector corresponds to a smaller typical displacement. Large Q is short distances. And what they found is that as they made the distance scale shorter and shorter, the particle motion was faster and faster. The important issue is that since they're saying at shorter distances, the particles move more rapidly, we are not discussing a diffusive um, process here, we're discussing something rather different. Uh, the other issue is, going back, the slow process is Q independent. And so, gee, 
that actually speaks to caging models. The reason it speaks to caging models is that if you have a particle that does Brownian motion by parking in a cage, hopping to another cage, parking in a cage, hopping to another cage, and this random hop, hop, hop is the random walk that gives you the slow diffusion. If you look at very short distances, something should happen to that slow process. Because at short distances, the slow process, hop, 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 starts to become visibly discrete. Well, that's not what you see. What they see is that the slow process, whatever it is, um, is Q independent. Okay. Let us chug ahead. That's Bremel and Dunstan. And we'll look at another set of experiments. And the new set of experiments are due to Delfino and collaborators. And the notion of the new set of experiments is we will look at a polymer. And the polymer they looked at was carboxy methyl cellulose. And the material they looked at was fairly high molecular weight. And as a result, the radius of gyration of the polymer happened to be about 50 nanometers. Question? Is carboxy methyl cellulose used in uh, chromatographic columns or adsorption? Um, you might. I actually don't know. Uh, the short form answer is no. This stuff is water soluble, oh. so it's not used in column. Okay. But you, a lot of these should remember. This is now a synthetic issue. A lot of polymers, yeah, they're water soluble. But then you do cross linking, and instead of having a linear chain, you form a blob that is big, 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 and it ceases to be soluble in a practical way. And now you have a column. But this is not cross linked. And what they did was to take. Uh, spheres of three sizes, 17, 47, and 102 nanometer. And guess what? They have here spheres that are considerably smaller than RG, and they have at the other end spheres that are considerably larger than, well, twice RG. And they have spheres that are about the same as RG. So they have three sizes of spheres. And they compare the diffusion of the three sizes of sphere in the same system. And you are now comparing the diffusion of objects that are smaller than the polymer molecule, the same size as, or larger than. Now that's a perfectly reasonable comparison viewed abstractly to make. You should, however, notice that there are theoretical models that say if you have a polymer solution and it's fairly concentrated, you have these long chains and they are entangled. And once they're entangled, the model says, well, it doesn't matter how long they are because the ends don't do very much except move forward or backwards. And the interesting distance scale becomes this distance scale psi. And psi is sort of the size of a hole in the polymer mesh. And if you say that's true, then the interesting comparison is beside, between objects of different sizes and the size of the hole. And the hole is much smaller than a polymer chain. The sort of limit, why do we know the hole is much smaller than a polymer chain? Well, suppose we have a dilute solution that is just on the edge of entangling. Okay? In that case, the distance between entanglement points can't be much larger than a polymer chain, because if it was, this polymer chain would only be entangled at one point, 
there wouldn't be a mesh work. So the entanglement notion is the lowest concentration at which you can possibly have entanglement is approximately when the radius of the chain is the same as the distance between entanglement points. And at all higher concentrations, psi becomes smaller and smaller. The radius of gyration shrinks, but much less. And in that case, the uh, interesting length scale and solution is much smaller than the polymer chain. Well, having said that, they did the experiment. And the reason the experiments appear in this chapter is the spectra they found were bimodal. Their spectra were adequately fit by a single exponential or two exponentials. That is, each mode was close to being a pure exponential. That says that each mode separately could perhaps be viewed as a diffusive process, um, though there must be some complications we are not quite seeing. Nonetheless, they do see two modes. Now, the reason you have to worry about saying it's at pure exponential is as follows. Suppose semi-log plot. Here's the dynamic structure factor. Here's time. This is a semi-log plot. Suppose the actual spectrum looked like that on the semi-log plot, meaning the relaxation is not a pure exponential. It occurs rap more rapidly at fast times and on the semi-log plot less rapidly at long times. Suppose you had a spectrum like that. Suppose you charge in and not paying much attention to the data, fit this to a single exponential. Well, you could say it's an approximation, but there's a problem with the approximation. If I just fit to the measurements up here, I get one slope. If I just fit to the measurements down here, I get a quite different slope. And the pure exponential fit, unless you're careful, and I'm not saying the paper we're talking about was not careful, I'm just showing where there's a hazard here. The hazard is that if you fit on different time scales, you get different slopes for the exponential, and that's because the exponential is somewhat cooperative. You can always draw a straight line through a set of points. It may be a foolish straight line because the points don't resemble a straight line, but you can always draw that straight line and you will get a result. And so what happens when they do this? Well, first of all, what they found was that there are two modes. And for the small spheres, the fast mode was dominant. For the slow spheres, I didn't say that right, sorry. At low concentrations, they found the fast mode was dominant. At high concentrations, the slow mode was dominant. And so far, we've only talked about the intermediate size spheres. I said that backwards the first time. We can draw a picture showing this. The other thing they found, so we'll start with the small spheres. And there are two modes. And the two modes both slow down as you increase. This is the diffusion coefficient corresponding to the mode. This is the concentration. And the first thing they find is that for the small spheres, the slowdown is over the observed range of polymer concentrations is, oh, a factor of three or six. I'm being approximate. For the large spheres, figures in the book. And you can look at this. And for the large spheres, the slowdown is, oh, maybe a factor of 10. And for the slow mode, it's some number like 300 or 400. It's more than two orders of magnitude. And so what you're saying is, for the, slow, for the small spheres, the two modes are affected only modestly, well actually it's a factor of three, it's plenty to see, uh, by the polymer. For the large spheres, the effect of the polymer is vastly more dramatic. And there is a crossover region when the spheres are about the same size as the polymer molecule. 
And it really does appear, though of course they only have three sphere sizes, it does appear there's a transition between the sphere is much smaller than the polymer and the sphere is much larger than the polymer. Now if you really want to say that statement and say there's a transition, you would really want more than three sphere sizes uh, for the simple reason that you ask, well, is it a continuous rollover or is there a real change from behavior class A to behavior class B? Does the rollover actually occur when R is equal to RG or is it someplace to one side or another? And if you want to settle that question, you'd have to use plenty of sphere sizes and then, if you're lucky, life becomes transparent. Well, that's what Kirill Strelecki did. He was my PhD student for his doctoral thesis. He did this in HPC, not carboxymethyl cellulose, but he used a whole bunch of sphere sizes and he in fact found exactly what is being implied by the very nice experiments of Delfino. Namely, there is, a, there is a behavioral class for spheres that are smaller than RG. There is a different behavioral class for spheres that are sort of larger than RG. Uh, there are several ways of characterizing the size of a polymer molecule. So, um, you, it's something, it, it, let's say it's a bit imprecise as to exactly what you call the size of the transition. But in fact, the transition is fairly large. It occurs approximately at the size of the polymer coil. And therefore, the solution, in my opinion, unsurprisingly, has a longest characteristic length scale, which is the size of a polymer chain. Well, that's fine unless you believe entanglement models, because entanglement models say that the characteristic longest length scale is this much shorter length scale, psi. Yeah, that's not my problem. Okay. We now advance to section 9.7. And 9.7 talks about probes in polyelectrolyte solutions. Now, probes in poly polyelectrolyte solutions are something that is not covered very heavily by my book. At some point I decided I have to stop someplace or the book will get bigger and bigger and the publisher only gave me 500 pages. And the time required to complete, instead of being a fixed date within my lifetime, will be divergent and I'll never finish the book. So I had to stop at some point. And I remind you, things that we stopped before getting to include rods, polyelectrolytes, uh, liquid crystal polymers, block copolymers, melts, oh, thread-like micelles. There are solutions, small molecules, but they form dynamic structures in the solution that are long and thready that look a lot like polymer chains, except they're not covalently cross-linked and they can go straight through each other. Well, having said that, there are a bunch of things we have did not cover. Nonetheless, I do briefly mention some of the results that do exist on polyelectrolyte systems, and I bring up some of the polyelectrolyte results so that you know they're there. So what did we say about polyelectrolytes? Well, the first issue is there's some extra variables in a polyelectrolyte system. That is, if you have a polyelectrolyte, the first material we worked on, polyacrylic acid, could be a polyelectrolyte, but we worked with the non-neutralized material. These are results of Tai Ho Lin and I. 
in which here is the carboxylic acid groups, and they're mostly non-neutralized. Well, some of them spontaneously ionize a bit. But what you could do is add base to the system, and now you have ionic ions on the chain, and you have sodium ions if you added sodium hydroxide. And guess what? You now have neutralized polyelectrolytes. Well, how much base did you add? There is a percent neutralization that determines what fraction of those groups are charged. Also, you could have a salt concentration determined by its ionic strength, I, which for monovalent ions is simply the molarity of the solution. We can go on. There's more complication, but we aren't doing polyelectrolytes. And there are extra variables. And having said there are extra variables, there are all sorts of experiments you can measure. Okay. For example, I, we will take, I believe it's figure 9-25. And we can measure the diffusion coefficient. We're looking at polystyrene spheres in a partly neutralized polyacrylic acid. Um, this one happens to be 60% neutralized. It's a not nice round number. It is, if I recall correctly, a 600 or a slightly smaller polymer. And we measure the diffusion coefficient of spheres as we add salt to the solution. And so we start with no added salt. That's, now you may say, gee, that's simple, isn't it? No, that's actually quite hazardous. The reason it's quite hazardous is, A, water ionizes a bit, and so you really can never get less than, in water, about 10 to the minus 7 molar ions because the water is ionized. Furthermore, water absorbs carbon dioxide from the air unless you're really rigorous about dealing with issues, and therefore, the P, well, the pH of water, if you actually look at it under these conditions, is more like 5, meaning you have something like 10 to the minus 5 molar hydrogen ions and other good stuff floating about. And so unless you're extremely careful in your work, uh, it's very hard to avoid introducing at least traces of small ions. And therefore, if you want to know what's going on, the experimental process is to be sure to add at least tiny amounts of salt, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, whatever, 10 to the minus 3 molar, 10 to the minus 4 molar, and then you are probably closer to knowing what's going on in the solution. Nonetheless, that's I equals 0. We didn't add anything. And as we increase the amount of salt, well, at zero polymer concentration, this is pol D versus polymer concentration, changing the salt concentration does almost nothing. But at higher co uh, salt concentrations, with increasing ionic strength, those curves flatten out. And the po as we, you increase the uh, salt concentration, the polymer is less and less able to retard the motion of the spheres. Why? Well, that's a good question. And you can come up with all sorts of explanations. Uh, gee, you added salt, the polymer is less rigid. You added salt, the electrostatic interactions between the polymer and the sphere are weakened. You can come up with all sorts of explanations. You notice it started to get very complicated. You can also look at Stokes-Einstein behavior, and you can compare the product diffusion coefficient times measured viscosity of the solution with what you would have in pure water. If the Stokes-Einstein equation worked, this number would stay 1 as you run up the polymer concentration and increase the salt concentration. That's not what happens. In fact, what happens is you have non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior, and the viscosity goes up, the diffusion coefficient goes down, 
but the matrix polymer is more effective at increasing the viscosity than it is at retarding the diffusion, and this number is larger than one. Uh, there are systems where it's less than one. The statement it's larger than one has the attractive feature that you simply cannot claim, oh, it's just the spheres are aggregating, there's stuff sticking to the spheres. That would give an effect of the wrong sign. Uh, so as we proceed, we see non-Stokes Einsteinian behavior, and we ask, well, are there ways to make the non-Stokes Einsteinian behavior uh, less? And the answer is that this number tends towards one. It doesn't get there. If you make the spheres larger, if you make the ionic strength larger, or for that matter, if you weaken the polyelectrolyte effect by um, reducing the percent neutralization. If you do any of these things, or all of them, the degree of non-Stokes Einsteinian behavior goes down. Okay, there is another theoretical piece in here. And the theoretical piece is there are people who will claim This is a claim. You can find it in the literature for yourself. That you get non-Stokes Einsteinian behavior if the probe size is less than, or maybe much less than, all of the characteristic lengths in solution. However, if the probes are big, the claim is that you must be getting Stokes Einsteinian behavior. Well, that's very nice, but if you believe that, uh, gee, if you see spheres and they're showing non Stokes Einsteinian behavior, the spheres must be smaller than the length scale. How big were the spheres we used in that experiment? Well, there were a series of sized spheres from 21 up to 655 nanometers, yes, diameter. And based on our measurements, since we were seeing non-Stokes Einsteinian behavior, except perhaps for the largest spheres, the longest length scale in these solutions must be greater than eh, 300 nanometers. Certainly, it must be greater than 50 nanometers, and it appeared it had to be greater than 300 nanometers. Well, that's a very long length scale. That's not what you would necessarily have expected, but that's, in fact, what's there. Okay. There's then a figure I dropped in. And the figure is, again, a work of myself, and it's work with LaCroix and Yambert. And it's figure, if I recall correctly, 9-27. And if you look at the figure, yeah, it's D versus C again. But if you look at the figure, yes, it's a semi-log, it's a linear semi-log plot. If you look at it, you realize D doesn't change very much. And we have a whole lot of points, and the points are concentrated on finding what is very clearly the initial slope. And in some cases, a simple exponent is a semi-log plot. A simple exponential slope is adequate. In some cases, a linear slope fit was adequate. And we worked very hard. We used spheres of size 7, 34 and if I recall correctly, 95 nanometers. The measurements you see are for two um, sizes of polystyrene sulfonate. But we had a fair amount of salt in it. And we look at several molecular weights of polystyrene sulfonate. And the question is, why did we work so hard to determine the initial slope, which is what we did. We determined the leading linear effect of adding polymer 
and how it slows down probe diffusion. The reason we did this is that there was a theoretical model. It was my calculation. <coughs> it's based on the Kirkwood Reisman picture of single chains. And what it says is, here's a probe sphere. We are in dilute solution. We want to find the leading slope, which is the dilute slope. So here is a polymer chain. The sphere moves. And as the sphere moves, the polymer chain gets to respond. But it's somewhat constrained. It can move. It can translate. So it has some translation. It can notice this side of the chain is closer to the sphere than this side is. So it can rotate. And it has some rotation vector omega, which clearly is perpendicular to the blackboard. And we can describe the polymer's chain, lowest approximation, as a sort of a bag of frictional beads that translates and rotates. But we can now calculate the hydrodynamic interaction back and forth between the sphere and the beads. And we can therefore calculate quantitatively how effective this chain is at slowing down the spheres. And the point of this was to see, well, can we do the calculation and does the calculation work? And the, calcula the direct calculation ends up with a single free parameter, there's a way of beating that limit, which we did eventually. But the point is, we could actually calculate the slopes, and we get the right answer. So that, that particular paper is a theoretical model test. It's an extremely important theoretical model test, because it tests the hydrodynamic interaction theory and it works. Okay. I'm doing fine on time since I started a bit late. Okay, let us step ahead again. And the step ahead again is to say there is something called solvent quality. And you can sort of look blankly and wonder what is solvent quality? Um, suppose we have a polymer chain. Here's a polymer coil. We have states of the system in which here comes a polymer coil. Here comes the polymer, very crudely drawn. And here comes another piece. And the two are in more or less direct contact. Yes. And you might ask, does this polymer prefer to have another piece of polymer coil as neighbor? Or does it prefer that the two polymers stay well apart from each other and it has solvent molecules as neighbors? And it isn't an absolute, we must have one or the other. It's a thermodynamic preference in contact. And the net result is, if the polymer chains prefer to be next to each other, the polymer coil stays fairly compact. If the polymer prefers to be um, in contact with solvent, well, you have the different pieces of the polymer in this picture have to push apart from each other so they don't bump into each other as much. And suddenly, the polymer coil gets larger. And if we, have a sol if we choose our solvent, we can have what is called a good solvent, in which the polymer prefers to see neighboring molecules be solvent. We can have what is called a theta solvent, in which there's a sort of indifference. And we could also have a poor solvent. An extreme example of poor solvent behavior are protein molecules. Protein molecules are nice and neatly folded and have particular groups on the outside and are lumps because proteins view water as a very poor solvent. 
And so they fold up tightly. And they fold up tightly so that all of the aliphatic groups, the hydrocarbons, try to hide on the inside of the polymer chain. Of course, they can't all manage to do this. And the groups on the polymer that are charged, the carboxylic acid groups, the amine groups that charge, sit on the outside and be charged. And so the polymer has charges on the outside, or tries to, and things that look more like oil on the inside, and it doesn't expand at all. And this is why polymer molecules are stable, because water is a very poor solvent. Now, you might think, gee, aren't proteins soluble in water? Yeah, they're still soluble, because they do this, but it's still a poor solvent effect. Okay, so we ask, what happens if we measure the diffusion coefficient versus polymer concentration, and we do use, take the same polymer, and we put it in two different solvents. Well, the answer, there are two sets of experiments, they're both in the book, and one, one approach to this is we will change the chemical identity of the solvent. And if we do that, we see a theta solvent behavior, and we see a good solvent behavior. And the diffusion coefficient in the theta solvent just falls stretched as a pure exponential e to the minus alpha c to something close to 1. And in the good solvent, it's e to the minus alpha c to the nu. And g, at high concentrations, we're out here in concentration, the theta solvent slows down the polymer more effectively than the good solvent does. Rather, the polymer and the theta solvent slows things down more effectively. Now, there's another way you can change solvent conditions without having to change the solvent molecule. And the alternative way to do things, <coughs> instead of changing the solvent, is to change the temperature. Because there are systems that approach being good solvents at one temperature, but if you change the temperature enough, you approach a theta point, and at the theta temperature, you get a different behavior. And those were experiments that were done by Delphine Colmanil and I. And once again, in the theta system, you see pure, something that's sort of like a straight line. And in the good system, you see something that's sort of like this. And, oh my, what's occurring? Well, the answer is you have different good and theta behavior. And for a bit, it appeared, we were at the first a bit enthusiastic. Gee, we found a solution. We found a prediction that is actually made by my model of polymer dynamics. And you see exactly what you expected to see. And then we realized. But if you look at the alternative models, all of the models we found actually show the same prediction. So this very pretty experiment doesn't really tell you anything, except that, you're, in some sense, the models agree with each other. Last thing I will discuss. Dependence. There was a period in the oh, late 80s, early 90s, when I would go around giving speeches on probe diffusion and what you saw and what it appeared to imply about polymer dynamics. And so I would go here or there or someplace else and I would give my remarks. And someone would stand up and complain that I had not reduced my measurements relative to the glass temperature. Um, now, hiding behind this not at all innocent question is a very complicated piece of theoret theoretical issue. But a piece of the notion is as follows. Here is a polymer solution, a polymer in solution, 
and I am representing the polymer as looking like a pearl necklace. The rate at which the polymer can move is determined by a drag coefficient, a resistance to motion of the individual beads. That's the same as the Stokes law drag coefficient, but it refers not to the whole chain, but to the little piece. Now, if you work in polymer melts, the issue is that G, as you change the temperature up or down, the drag coefficient of the individual polymer beads slows down or increases. The drag coefficient goes down or up. And as you change the temperature, therefore, the whole dynamics of the system changes on its time scale, not because something in particular is happening to the whole chain motion, but because the drag coefficient of the individual beads is changed. In fact, there is a whole experimental approach called time temperature reduction. And the notion in time temperature reduction is that you can change the time scale on which things are happening by changing the temperature. And therefore, you can do what appears to be a measurement over a very wide range of frequencies, response frequencies, by doing a measurement over a much narrower range and doing it over a series of temperatures and at each temperature, uh, the same behavior occurs at different frequencies. And therefore, by changing the frequency, the temperature, you can compress all of these behaviors so you actually look at them experimentally in one relatively narrow frequency regime. Well, that's time temperature dependence. Now, how does time temperature dependence come into our probe diffusion work? And the answer is that um, this drag coefficient was said to depend, and it was a very vague question, it wasn't a detailed analysis, exponentially on the concentration. And therefore, as I changed the concentration, I was changing the drag coefficient. Now, where, what does this have to do with the glass? Well, I'm going to draw another picture. Two pictures. And so we will plot a property that depends on how easily the beads can move, namely the viscosity, the resistance to pouring. And I will plot this as a function of temperature. And if I plot this as a function of temperature, what happens is I cool the system off, the viscosity increases, and then it increases very rapidly indeed. And eventually I get to something called the glass. Now, the picture I've just drawn is for a polymer melt. And the notion is that as um, T approaches this temperature, Tg, the glass temperature, the viscosity sort of diverges. Now, it doesn't really diverge. But if the viscosity is 10 to the 14 times the viscosity that you had when you had a simple fluid melt, it doesn't pour. It's, it's practically, but not quite, a solid. That's the glass temperature. If you look at large numbers of behaviors, you can say the interesting variable is T minus Tg, the distance from the glass temperature. And if you want to compare how different polymeric melts are behaving, the sensible comparison is not to compare them at the same temperature, but at the same temperature, distance away from the glass temperature. Now, you could also be a little fancier and say maybe you ought to normalize like this, because there are systems that have very low glass temperatures and systems that are, have very high glass temperatures. But that is the glass temperature idea. The notion um, for polymer solutions is that if we look at 1 over D, which is sort of like a viscosity, 
and we look versus constant polymer concentration, 1 over D is doing this, and there is some glass in some sense. That is, eventually things don't move, or something happens. And therefore, I ought to reduce relative to this glass temperature. So Carol Quinlan and I did this experiment. And what we said is, well, how do we reduce relative to the glass temperature? And the answer is, we will do measurements of D at a series of, te at a series of temperatures. And the reason we will do this at a series of temperatures is as follows. This picture here actually leads to something called the vogel folker taman equation and says D should go as some D0. And then there's a temperature T because basic diffusion coefficient scales is temperature. And then there's an e to the minus, some constant. There's a constant over T minus Tg. And you notice this thing has the feature as we approach, oh, I should put a plus sign there. The sign is, of course, not meaningful because A is a signed number. But the issue is that as the temperature approaches the glass temperature, this factor becomes extremely large. And therefore, I'll put the minus sign in. It's diffusion. And therefore, this number becomes large. And therefore, the temperature goes to 0 as you approach the glass temperature. Well, if I'm doing this in polymer solutions, the claim is at each concentration, because Tg is a function of polymer concentration. As I change the polymer concentration, I'm changing the glass temperature. And therefore, instead of quoting everything at the same temperature, I should quote all of my measurements at the same T minus Tg. OK? So someplace I should establish Tg for these solutions. And if I quote measurements at <coughs> if I quote measurements at different concentrations, I should also be at the same time be comparing measurements at different temperatures rather than at the same temperature, which is what I've been doing. Okay, well this equation has a feature. It makes a prediction as to how D should depend on temperature, doesn't it? There's however another prediction as to how D should depend on temperature. Namely, D should, if we compare with a D with T over eta of the Solman, we should get a straight line. Yes? OK, so we did all the experiments. And the first thing that happened is that if you measure D at a series of temperatures and fit to this form, you discover that Tg is extremely low, like minus 100 centigrade. That's not a physical temperature, of course, for water, because it freezes. However, what we found, you do the temperature dependence at a series of different polymer concentrations, and you ask, how does the apparent Tg, whether you believe this makes any sense or not, depend on temperature, and the answer is the apparent Tg is independent of polymer concentration. And therefore, if you believed that you were supposed to reduce relative to Tg, well, we did the experiment, and the answer is Tg is the same at all concentrations, contrary to what was being said, and therefore the reduction relative to Tg wouldn't do anything. The second thing we said is, well, we can look at D versus T over eta sub S. And uh, G, D is linear in T over eta. This is eta of the solution. 
or eta of the solvent, it doesn't really matter which, because they just track each other. And if you look for curvature here, well, the curvature is slightly larger than the scatter of the points. And so you could say there's a little curvature, which, by the way, is independent of polymer molecular weight. And the best we can say is, to very quite good approximation, um, D just scales as temperature over solution viscosity linearly, and there's no sign of any deviation from linear behavior. Um, maybe there's a slight sign, it's sort of a 1 or a 2 percent effect, and your measurements are accurate to a bit better than 1 percent. So you're sort of at the point where you are leaning hard on your data to claim that you're seeing a deviation from what Stokes Einstein would tell you to expect for the temperature dependence. So that's temperature dependence. However, we were challenged to do a reduction relative to the glass temperature. And what we showed was that the relevant glass temperature for these experimental measurements is independent from polymer concentration. And since it's independent from polymer concentration, the reduction relative to the glass temperature doesn't do anything. And we could also say, ask, well, how, what is the dependence on solvent viscosity, which is temperature dependent? And the answer is D is linear in T over A to solvent. And therefore, any hydrodynamic picture or any picture that says the solvent viscosity controls things works just fine. So that's it for temperature dependence. And we are now at the end of today's lecture.